Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Mary Ashen, CEO of B'nai B'rith International. Thank you for being with us today. I'm joined by my colleague, David Michaels, B'nai B'rith's Director of United Nations and Intercommunal Affairs. And we want to welcome you just after Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israel's 73rd Independence Day, to an important conversation with Gilad Erdan, Ambassador of Israel to the United States and to the United Nations. Having led Jewish communal engagement at the UN since the World Body's founding in 1945, we're profoundly committed to protecting the rights and well being of Israel within multilateral settings. And as an organization headquartered in the United States, we continue to champion and celebrate a vital US Israel friendship built upon core shared values and interests. We're honored to have the ambassador with us today to talk about some mutual concerns, as well as challenges that Israel and its allies face. But first, a bit of background about our guest. His Excellency Gilad Erdan currently serves as Israel's 19th ambassador to the United States and 18th ambassador to the United Nations. He's the first Israeli ambassador to serve in this dual position in 60 years. Previously, Ambassador Erdan served for 13 years as a senior minister in numerous roles in the Israeli government and as a member of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, from, 20, from 2003 to 2020. He was also a member of the security cabinet. From 2015 to 2020, Ambassador Erdan was Minister of Public Security and Minister of Strategic Affairs. And he also served as Minister of Communications and as Minister of Environmental Protection. Mr. Ambassador, a belated Chag Sameach, and thank you so much for spending some time with us today. So, uh, Chag Sameach again, uh, David, Dan, Chag Sameach, uh, everyone, and thank you for having me. And uh, thank you for that introduction. I really appreciate uh, the work you and Chuck are doing in leading this uh, great organization and David and Millie's tireless efforts at, uh, as uh, Bnei B'rit uh, representatives here in New York to the United Nations. Bnei B'rit has been a cornerstone of uh, Jewish advocacy efforts at the UN. In fact, I believe you were the first major Jewish organization at the UN's founding, even before Israel was a state. Uh, so the longevity and the, de the dedication with which Bnei B'rit engages with UN leaders, uh, not only in New York, but also in uh, Paris, in Geneva, and other places, is remarkable. Um, personally, I've been very impressed by your work in advancing Jewish issues, and particularly in the way uh, you combat anti-Semitism and promote uh, Israel. I think that your work in civil society is the perfect complement uh, to my efforts uh, here in the public se sector. And I know that we are going to work together closely on many issues. And that is why I thank you for this opportunity uh, to address your organization. Friends, uh, just last week, we celebrated Yom Ha'atzma'ut and how in just 73 years, we have become a powerful and thriving democracy. This year, we signed four historic peace agreements and more are on the way. A uh, growing number of countries recognize our incredible, incredible achievements in science, um, art, medicine, innovation, and are looking to work uh, with us. So I want to use this uh, opportunity before I tell you more about what am I doing to develop those uh, new relationships, uh, I want to use this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about uh, myself. Uh, I grew up in an Orthodox family uh, in Ashkelon. Later, I uh, graduated from uh, Netiv Meir, which is a, a, boarding, a, a boarding school, yeshiva boarding school in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors. Uh, three of them survived uh, Auschwitz. and. Uh, in large part, uh, this is what drives me today uh, as a civil servant. Uh, as you mentioned, I was elected to the Knesset in 2003. I went on to serve uh, there for 17 years uh, in many committees. I chaired the Economic Affairs Committees, 
Uh, and of, later I was appointed as a minister in Netanyahu's uh, uh, government. I served for several in several uh, roles. You mentioned uh, them. And uh, in, two, in the year 2020, I accepted uh, the prime minister's uh, offer uh, to be appointed as Israel's ambassador to the United Nations and the United States. And why am I sharing uh, this with you? Uh, I'm sharing this with you because now I feel that as Israel's ambassador, uh, I am utilizing this experience to defend Israel on the world stage and also to deepen the bond with our greatest ally, the United States uh, of America. And I would like to uh, mention briefly uh, my uh, agenda and my main priorities. Uh, my first priority, and I believe it doesn't uh, even need to be uh, said, because, but I will say it anyway, that my central role and focus is to strengthen the bipartisan support uh, for Israel, and I will do it by uh, building ties between different communities in Israel and all communities uh, in, the, in the American uh, society. My second priority, um, specifically after serving for the past five years as Minister of Strategic Affairs, where I led uh, the fight against the BDS uh, organizations, is to fight back against them and to fight basically all forms of anti-Semitism. This is something which is very important to me also because of my personal uh, background and I would do it here at the UN and in general. Um, third priority of mine uh, is going to be to work hard in order to expand the circle of peace that was created by the Abram Accords that we just signed and of course, last but not least, at the top of my priorities is combating the existential threat that is posed uh, by Iran. So uh, David and Dan, I think I have spoken enough. Maybe back to you for some Q&A. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. Well, let's begin with the United Nations, uh, You know, the double standard to which Israel has been subjected uh, for, for so many years. And whether it's uh, item seven at the Human Rights Council, uh, the only permanent agenda item targeting one member state, uh, the highly politicized mandate of UNRWA, you spoke on UNRWA just about 10 days ago, gave an important statement on that. Uh, the World Health Organization singling out of Israel for criticism or units in the UN bureaucracy dedicated to advancing only the Palestinian political narrative and goals. Anti-Israel bias has really been endemic at the UN. And how do you how do you see that? In what ways do you plan to, to take on that reality? And how can these issues really be addressed? Well, uh, thank you, Dan, for that important uh, question. I think that uh, we can all agree with your uh, premise that, uh, you know, Israel suffers from an inherent bias uh, against it that is taking place uh, at the UN. But it should also be said that we should not despair. We should not despair because we really need to understand the way the UN is functioning and where this uh, inherent bias is coming from. And I believe after uh, serving here for a few months and uh, uh, looking after the UN in my previous uh, roles, that it stems from two main factors. One main factor is that countries at the UN, they, they do not vote uh, based on their bilateral, sometimes very close relations with the state of Israel. On the contrary, they tend to vote based uh, or according to their regional or religious uh, blocks. That is how we got uh, this uh, famous uh, automatic majority against uh, the state of Israel. Because even if we have a very good collaboration with an Arab, uh, uh, with an Arab country, you can you could find the, the, this specific country uh, voting against the state of Israel because they feel that they belong 
uh, to their group of, uh, I can give, give an example, the uh, organizations of uh, Islamic uh, cooperation that is comprised of 56 uh, member states. So they prefer not to be punished within their own uh, uh, group, regional group or a religious group and, and not to uh, risk themselves by supporting the state of Israel. But I'm trying to emphasize it to highlight the fact that even if we see a vote against Israel and 150 member states, they vote against us, it doesn't reflect the real positioning, the real situation of Israel in the world. It doesn't mean at all that we are uh, isolated. And a second, uh, maybe a, a, a second factor that we have to take into consideration is the fact that the UN, uh, the UN has become a very, very complicated, convoluted in a way, organ organization, which means that it's almost impossible to pass uh, new resolutions. The method at the UN is to bring old resolutions and to try to, uh, usually, you know, I support uh, recycling, but I do not support recycling of old flawed resolutions. But that's what they do here at the UN. Uh, they, they try to bring all the res resolutions and to recycle them. Whenever they try to bring new resolutions, for example, they try to pass a resolution to help uh, tackle fight COVID-19. It took them almost one year to pass this useless uh, resolution. So that is how, for example, we find ourselves year after year dealing with the Palestinian package, a package of 20 resolutions that uh, are aimed to support the Palestinians, but are totally dis detached from the reality uh, on the ground. So we don't have to take uh, all those resolutions uh, as seriously as we take them uh, usually. Uh, but you asked me also what can be done in order to minimize, uh, to diminish this uh, inherent bias. So I'm trying to use uh, four tactics. Uh, the, first of, the first one of them is to try to convince member states to break away from their blocks uh, and, to be, and to focus on the close bilateral relations that they have uh, with Israel. I think that we succeeded on doing that uh, with uh, uh, countries like Hungary or the Czech Republic. Uh, you can see them uh, voting uh, on issues that are related to Israel separately from the European uh, Union. And I will continue to work hard in order to convince more countries uh, to uh, vote separately on issues uh, that are related to Israel separately from their regional or uh, religious group. Uh, another tactic is to try to use the historic Abram Accords that uh, we signed uh, recently. Uh, it creates a different atmosphere towards Israel here at the UN. I had the opportunity to already hold uh, host few events with my uh, Arab uh, counterparts. I uh, hosted. Uh, an event with my uh, Emirati uh, counterpart that was focused on women in diplomacy. This week, I'm going to host uh, a joint event with the Moroccan ambassador here at the UN that will be focused on how to deal uh, with uh, food, uh, food insecurity. So those uh, public events that are showcasing our collaboration are really help helping to change the atmosphere and it makes it much harder for member states to vote and to uh, demonize Israel whenever everyone can see that we are cooperating with the Arab, uh, with the Arab world. Uh, third tactic is to try to get uh, impressive, inspiring Israeli candidates to be elected uh, to influential uh, roles here at the UN. We had a huge success with the candidacy of uh, Miss Odelia Fitusi, who was uh, elected with uh, really a, a vast majority of member states who supported her. Uh, she's an inspiring woman with disability who got, who were, who was elected to serve on the, uh, the UN uh, Committee for the Rights of People with uh, Disabilities. Now we have a very special 
a new special candidate, the legal advisor of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that we're trying uh, to get him uh, elected to the International uh, Law Commission. And uh, I think that is another tactic that can be used in order to change the discourse uh, over uh, about Israel. And I would con conclude with maybe the last tactic, which is very important for me because I used to implement it as Minister of Strategic Affairs, which says Israel has nothing to hide. We are so proud uh, in our values, in our contribution. So we should always move from defense and be only on the offense. We should expose the hypocrisy of our enemies. We should uh, demonstrate or show everyone their double standard. And to conclude, I would say by implementing all those tactics, I am optimistic that we will be able to diminish and to really uh, minimize the inter inherent bias that still exists here at the UN. Shifting back to U.S.-Israel relations, of course, preserving bipartisan American support for a, a close alliance with Israel is crucial, and you uh, you talked about that in your opening uh, comments. I'd like to talk a little bit more, if I could, about uh, how you plan to cultivate the support as Israel's new ambassador to the U.S., and I know a couple of months ago uh, you, you hit the road and you were down in, uh, I think, in Georgia and Alabama, so tell us a little bit more about how that's working. Uh, well, as as you said, uh, as you said, Dan, um, and since maybe the Israel was founded and uh, the United States of America, President Truman uh, was the first leader to uh, recognize uh, Israel. So since then, uh, America, the United States of America is our closest and most important ally. So for me, as Israel's ambassador to the United States, Clearly, that maintaining and strengthening the bipartisan support for Israel is a top uh, priority for Israel and for me uh, as an ambassador. So, first of all, what I have, what I did uh, since I uh, I got uh, my role in in Washington is that I have already had many many conversations with lawmakers and officials on both uh, sides of the aisle. And I have to tell you that because we hear different voices on this issue, the bipartisan support uh, for Israel is still very, very strong. But it's true that we have to consider and to take into our consideration that, that there are demographic shifts and also uh, there are changing realities. Uh, that are taking place not only in the United States, but also in Israel. And they require me as an ambassador to continue to look for ways to nurture the relationships, find new ways, uh, for example, not only to uh, collaborate, to continue the collaborations, uh, collaboration on so many issues that we have with the administration, but to try to expand this collaboration to, uh, uh, to new fields and areas that would include all parts of the American uh, societies. And I feel, and I know it also from my uh, experience uh, as, uh, as the Minister of Environmental Protection, who uh, uh, was in charge to design Israel's uh, national plan to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And I know how the administration, the current administration, is committed to fighting climate change. So this is a new area that Israel is a world uh, leader. Uh, this week, President Biden is hosting uh, a leaders' uh, summit on climate change. Prime Minister Netanyahu will going is will about will speak there, and he is going to uh, demonstrate how Israel can contribute to the efforts. Uh, to uh, to grapple with uh, with the severe consequences of consequences of climate change, like how to supply clean uh, energy, renewable energy, how uh, to deal with uh, with water scarcity, uh, how to deal with food uh, insecurity. Those are the issues that we can expand our collaboration 
with the new administration, and that will help us to maintain and even strengthen uh, the bipartisan support. Another uh, important issue that we all have to bear in mind is that uh, the, uh, the support, the military aid that we get, we receive from the American administration is mutually beneficial. From time to time, we hear from time to time we hear voices that are asking, demanding to condition uh, this uh, aid in some uh, terms. I was encouraged to hear the strong commitment that came from uh, the president and his uh, administration, and I was also encouraged to meet many Democrats. For example, I met uh, Representative Congresswoman uh, Steph uh, Stephanie Murphy from Florida. Uh, she's an expert on security issues. So she served for many years uh, at the uh, um, at, at the Pentagon, and she just recently published an article where she uh, described and gave so many examples how the intelligence that Israel shares, our agencies are sharing with uh, the uh, the American the administration agencies, is helping to save so many lives of American civilians. And troops, and she called the American the uh, the military aid that we receive. She called it a smart, targeted uh, investment uh, in the security of the United States. And and lastly, as you uh, as you recalled, it's also extremely important to build ties between Israel and Israelis and all of the different communities uh, in the in the United States. Obviously, first and foremost, the American Jewish community, which is the foundation of the U.S.-Israel Special uh, Alliance. And I see myself uh, as, uh, as the ambassador who is committed to serve as a bridge between the government of Israel and all parts of American Jewry, which I consider as my brothers and sister. But I also think it's crucial to build strong ties with other communities and that is why, as you mentioned, Dan, I decided to dedicate my first uh, formal trip outside of DC to visit uh, the South. I visited uh, Charleston, uh, uh, where I visited the plantations. I visited uh, Montgomery, uh, Alabama, where I, had, I visited the Rosa Parks uh, Museum. And I had the opportunity to cross the Edmund Pettus uh, Bridge. And I was accompanied by key. African American leaders who shared with me their personal stories. And I really had the opportunity to learn about the important contribution of the African American uh, community to the American society and basically uh, to the American story. And maybe my biggest takeaway from this trip was the many similarities that exist between the Jewish and African American uh, communities. We all, we all, we both uh, suffered from persecution, we fought against uh, slavery, and today we must use uh, our shared legacies in order to fight and to be committed to fight the holy struggle against all forms of hate. And this is only one example, how can I strengthen the uh, personal and, uh, connections and ties between the American people and uh, the people of Israel, and in on by doing so, to strengthen the bipartisan uh, support uh, for the state of Israel. And uh, I believe, again, these interactions uh, are so important to connect uh, the two uh, societies that uh, they will help to sustain and nourish the strategic alliance between our countries. Thank you. David, uh, why don't you jump in here? Sure, sure, Dan, and thank you again so much, Mr. Ambassador, for being with us. As you alluded to earlier, uh, the biggest disruptor to peace and security in your neighborhood in the Middle East uh, has certainly been the regime in Iran, uh, which uh, is dedicated, uh, is sw sworn to be dedicated to Israel's destruction, the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. How might the UN engage meaningfully, constructively on Iran's nuclear program as well as Iran's bad behavior more generally? I, I couldn't hear you. Well. Did, did you say UN and constructively? <laughs> no. 
Okay, but but uh, seriously, no, because it sounds like science fiction. But uh, seriously, uh, I really, and again, it will sound uh, cynicism, cynicism, but I, I really think that a good place uh, for the UN to start uh, would be to actually engage because it never happened until today. You know, I'm going to uh, speak um, in front of the Security Council this uh, Thursday. There's a monthly uh, debate discussion, uh, which is called the situation in the Middle East, including the Palestinian question. It's a monthly discussion. Uh, each time, I hope, that because it's called the situation in the Middle East, maybe they will discuss, members of the Security Council, they will discuss uh, the real problems that undermines uh, peace and stability and security in the Middle East, meaning uh, Iran and uh, you know, its uh, malign activities uh, in our region, but it never happened. Uh, they still continue to talk only about uh, the Palestinians and their false uh, accu accus accusations against uh, the state of Israel. So, so the first thing I accept them to do is really to bring uh, the threats that Iran poses to, uh, uh, to the table of the Security Council and start discussing them uh, there. I hope and I, uh, I'm sure that everyone here understands that uh, Israel is uh, in a unique position when it comes to Iran, because only for Israel, Iran is an existential threat. We are the only country around the world that Iran's leaders promise to destroy. They promise to annihilate us. And even the most moderate uh, leader of Iran, Rafsan, Rafsanjani, used to call us a one-bomb state. So for me, it is outrageous to see that the UN doesn't take this uh, threat seriously because how is it possible that a member state of the UN threatens to destroy, to annihilate another member state and there is no resolution denouncing uh, it? So I continuously uh, raise with the Security Council and the Secretary uh, General in speeches and in letters, I supply them all the facts about Iran's terror uh, proxies that, uh, thanks to the fact that Iran uh, continued to transfer uh, weaponry uh, and components of missile and rockets, uh, they surround Israel with hundreds of thousands of missile and rockets that are pointed at our civilians and cities. And again, I think we should all try to put pressure on the UN bodies uh, to supply answers. How are there no uh, sanctions on Iran for funneling money into the hands of terrorists that undermine the peace and security of our entire region? Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, and many, many uh, others. Uh, I think that the UN constructive, constructively can engage with the grave human rights violations that is taking place uh, at Iran. I just met recently with a group of Iranian American human rights activists uh, who shared with me their really heartbreaking stories, uh, which I have shared with the United Nations. More than 4,000 people were executed uh, under the presidency of uh, Rouhani. Where is the Human Rights uh, Council? Why don't they use their time to discuss these cases instead of wasting its time talking only? Uh, about Israel. And uh, another example maybe is that the international uh, community, and that maybe this is the most relevant example. While we are speaking here about the UN and Iran, uh, the P5 plus one, they are meeting now in Vienna, trying to rejoin the fundamentally flawed Iran deal. We all remember that Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu, opposed that deal from the beginning. And only now, after several years, now everyone agrees that the old agreement, the JCPOA, is not enough, that it cannot address the threat that Iran poses. That is why, and pay attention, that is why 
we hear them saying that we need a longer, a stronger deal. The meaning of that sentence that it is, is that the JCPOA is not sufficient, but they, not like Israel, they believe that by rejoining the same old flawed deal, they will be able to build trust with Iran and the Ayatollahs, and they will agree uh, to an improved agreement uh, in the future. Israel thinks differently. We think that this would be a serious mistake to rejoin the agreement, because once the uh, Iranians will be back in the JCPOA and sanctions are lifted, and in few years from now, all the restrictions will be uh, lifted, Iran will have no incentive to negotiate a longer, stronger deal that will be uh, worse uh, for them. So we are committed to what we always said. We support a diplomatic solution, but a real solution that genuinely can stop Iran from becoming a nuclear threshold. And that can be achieved only by a combination of crippling economic sanctions. And as President Roosevelt used to say, speak softly with uh, diplomacy, but also carry a big stick and only then you will go far. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Dan, I think the Ambassador may have time for only one more question. So why don't yes, you- Yes, uh, exactly, exactly. So uh, let's close with this a very important question, uh, Minister Ambassador. As a global community and a global organization, uh, another priority of B'nai B'rith is fighting anti-Semitism, which unfortunately has persisted. It's, it's worsened, it's spiking in Europe and so many other places. Um, we're encor encouraged to see more and more countries and, and now even some UN officials endorsing the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism. You've done so much important work, really uh, a pioneering work in, in combating BDS as a, as, as a form of anti-Semitism. So what do you advocate as a means to combat hatred of the Jewish people? Yeah, uh, our time is over, but uh, as you said, this, uh, this question is uh, so important for me also because of my personal background. So I really want to, uh, uh, to elaborate a little bit about the uh, importance of this fight and what what am I doing here at the UN? Also, we're in a collaboration uh, with you. Um, so, as the grandson of Holocaust survivors, uh, this is really an issue that is very close uh, to my heart. And I agree with you that the double standard that uh, is used against Israel at the UN contributes to the even wider delegitimization campaign uh, against Israel and uh, against the Jewish people. We all remember that uh, in the past, our first prime minister, Ben-Gurion, ben used to call uh, the, the UN, he called it um shmum, which means that, you know, we don't have to take seriously whatever happens at the UN. But I believe, like you, that today, mainly because of social media, because they can spread their lies and incitement so rapidly, uh, we cannot dismiss uh, the UN, because many times what happens at the UN or in Geneva doesn't always stay in New York uh, or in Geneva. And the resolutions that are uh, that are being decided here, like to recognize the Palestinians as a non-member state, uh, are being used uh, to uh, justify terrible resolutions, like the uh, the resolution that was taken that was decided. Uh, a decision that was decided by the International Criminal Court uh, to uh, begin uh, investigating uh, Israel. So we need to take it uh, seriously. And that is why I promote, I'm promoting now two important uh, initiatives uh, at the UN to fight anti-Semitism. Uh, the first initiative is to try to pass a General Assembly uh, resolution uh, that will help us effectively to combat the ugly phenomenon of Holocaust uh, denial that uh, is more prevalent today on uh, social media, but it's a very dangerous uh, phenomenon for whoever wants to continue the fight against anti-Semitism and to educate uh, the young generation 
uh, against uh, ra- all forms of racism and anti-Semitism. And uh, the second uh, initiative that I'm uh, promoting these days is to uh, work with the Secretary General and other UN uh, bodies on the adoption of the IRA definition as the official definition for all UN uh, bodies. We all understand the importance of uh, IRA uh, because first of all, when if you want to fight anti-Semitism, you need to know how to recognize uh, anti-Semitism when you meet it. Uh, and it's already a definition that is um, widely accepted by so many uh, countries and uh, influential uh, NGOs. And it's uh, also encompasses all forms of modern anti-Semitism, including the demonization and delegitimization the, the, of the one and only uh, Jewish state. So if we'll succeed and we can do it together to uh, convince the UN to adopt it as its formal uh, definition, I'm 100% convinced that it will help us to reduce the demonization of Israel at the UN. It will help us to demand accountability from uh, UN bodies like uh, UNRWA, for example, that just recently there was a report that that, uh, demonstrated how UNRWA is allowing anti-Semitic content to be taught uh, in their uh, schools, it will help us to challenge the uh, support the UN that the UN gives to uh, groups that promote uh, anti-Semitic stereotypes or or support uh, the BDS. So to to summarize, uh, I agree that anti-Semitism, unfortunately, is still a growing problem. But together, uh, we are taking serious measures to fight against it and. I want to thank you, by the way, I want to thank Bnei Brit for being a, a very important ally in this fight. And if we will co- cooperate, all the Jewish organizations and representatives of Israel, I'm sure we'll be able to win against this ugly phenomenon. Well, thank you. And uh, with that, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Ambassador Erdan, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a privilege to have you with us. We appreciate your leadership, your partnership, and your critical work on behalf of the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Thank you, Dan, and we will definitely continue, we'll continue to working together uh, to fight those uh, against those uh, dangerous phenomenon. Thank you, and to strengthen the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Well, I want to thank Ambassador Gilad Erdan, Ambassador of Israel to the United States and the United Nations, for being with us today, and my colleague, David Michaels. I also want to thank all of B'nai B'rith's leaders and members around the U.S. and around the world, particularly our President Charles Kaufman and U.N. Affairs Chair Millie Maggot, for their engagement in standing up for the world's only Jewish state in the halls of power internationally. With invaluable assistance uh, by David and Oren Drory, our program officer for UN Affairs, we've just concluded B'nai B'rith's own seasonal marathon of advocacy meetings with dozens of ambassadors to the Human Rights Council in Geneva and UNESCO in Paris. We'll continue to fight proudly for the safety, equality, and fair treatment of Israel, a lone democracy in a frequently challenging neighborhood. A recording of this conversation will be available on demand on our YouTube channel shortly. I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and I hope you will return for future discussions. Until then, please take care, continue to be well. We look forward to seeing you again soon.